Thank you for coming to hear about Toussaint Louverture. And of course, um, this is Black History Month, so it's a kind of particularly nice moment to be talking about um, Toussaint and the Haitian Revolution. So what I want to do is really to talk about, um, through Toussaint Louverture, to talk about the Haitian Revolution, which is, I think, one of the most um, comprehensive and one of the purest examples of revolutionary change that we have had in the uh, history of the modern world. The Haitian Revolution was really a series of changes that took place between 1791 and 1804. And it's generally uh, described as uh, the only successful uh, revolution of enslaved people. And it took place in the French colony of Saint-Domingue, which um, uh, was, is in the Caribbean and was France's richest colony. And it led in the year 1804 to the establishment of um, the state of Haiti, um, which, which is the world's first um, independent black post-colonial state. So what I'll do, what I'll try and do in this lecture is um, I'll talk a bit about Toussaint Louverture, but I'll also, as the title of the lecture suggests, talk about the Haitian Revolution. Because although my book is a biography, I've really used Toussaint Louverture, who was the kind of leader of this revolution, as a way of talking about the revolution itself. It, it's the revolution itself, which I think is, is the really interesting subject. And Toussaint is like a vehicle, like, like, like a means of talking about this revolution. Because I think, uh, as I hope to be able to show to you in the course of the lecture, um, this is the world's greatest and most um, impactful revolution. And, and, I, and I mark my words because we've had a lot of revolutions in history. But to my mind, the Haitian Revolution is the greatest revolution of modern times. And I'll try and show you um, uh, uh, through various aspects of it why. So let me start with just quickly um, describing this revolution to you, because you may not be familiar with um, all the details of it. So <clears throat> it happened in this place called Saint-Domingue, which, um, which was, as I say, a, a colony of France in the Caribbean. It was France's wealthiest colony. Um, so it produced, it was called, one of its nicknames was the Pearl of the Antilles. It produced fabulous amounts of uh, wealth uh, through uh, the production of sugar, coffee, cotton, uh, indigo, um, and, and various other uh, products uh, uh, which were uh, greatly prized uh, at the time uh, in, the, um, in the colonial world. However, all of this wealth was produced by the enslaved population. Um, uh, and by the year 1789, you had about 500,000 slaves um, in uh, uh, the colony of Saint-Domingue. Uh, to give you a sense of the, the, the contrast in the numbers, the number of white settlers there at, at that time was about 30,000, right? So you had 30,000 white slaves and white, white settlers, sorry, and about 500,000 um, enslaved uh, men and women. Now, the thing about these enslaved men and women is that most of them were actually, in the late 18th century, born in Africa, and they enjoyed no civil or political rights, uh, uh, none at all. Um, they, were, they were considered as, as property. Uh, they belonged to, to their owners. So when the revolution happened in France in 1789, and you may have heard of this revolution, right? This was the revolution that promised people liberty, equality, and fraternity, these great principles. So when this revolution happened in France, the slaves turned round to the uh, new revolutionary leaders in France and said, well, what about these rights for us? Can we also have some liberty, equality, and fraternity? And the French said, no, no. This is basically only for white people. I mean, they didn't put it quite so crudely, but that's basically what they meant. So in, this is a, a, a kind of, a, a, representation of uh, a slave plantation in the late 18th century. And so very quickly, the slaves decided they had to take matters into their own hands. And in 1791, 
at uh, this very famous ceremony at, at a place called Bois Caiman in, in Haiti, the slaves uh, launch their insurrection in August 1791. And basically, this is the insurrection where they demand to be given the same rights as um, French citizens. And the revolution starts. Uh, it uh, very quickly spreads to uh, uh, most of the territory. Um, there's a lot of violence, uh, and a lot of uh, uh, white settlers are killed. Um, <clears throat> however, by 1793, the French realize that there's nothing that they can do to stop uh, uh, the, the demands of, of the slaves for their freedom. So in 1793 in Saint-Domingue, the, uh, <clears throat> the slaves receive their freedom. And a year later, uh, in 1794, um, <clears throat> the uh, French National Assembly in Paris proclaims the abolition of slavery. And so this is uh, a, a, an important moment for France as a whole. However, you will note that the abolition in France comes after the abolition in Saint-Domingue. And so Saint-Domingue is really the main reason why the French decide in 1794 to abolish uh, slavery. And, and that already is something important uh, uh, to bear in mind because it's not always the way in which the story is told, even to this day in France. The French themselves, when they talk about the history of slavery and the history of abolition, they often just say, well, in 1794, our glorious National Assembly abolished slavery. What they forget to mention is that the reason, the main reason they did this was because um, the slaves in Boacaima um, launched this insurrection in 1791. So at this point, 1791, <coughs> appears on the stage a man called Toussaint Louverture. Nobody had heard of him before. And indeed, in 1791, he, didn't, he wasn't even calling himself uh, by that name. He would, he would soon come to be called the Black Spartacus, but I'll come back to that a little later. Toussaint was born in um, 17, sometime in the early 1740s. I say sometime in the early 1740s because we don't know for sure when exactly he was born. Um, enslaved people didn't have birth certificates, so um, we think it's probably uh, 1740, 1741, uh, around there. His parents were enslaved and captured in, uh, in West Africa from the Kingdom of Alada, which in, in, in today's terms is the Central African Republic of Benin. And they were brought over to Saint-Domingue in the early 18th century. And uh, Toussaint was born there, um, uh, as I say, sometime in the early 1740s. He spent the first really 50 years of his life on, in a single place on this farm that uh, uh, probably looked uh, rather like this. It was a, a farm called Breda in the north of the colony. Um, <clears throat> he, was, he started his uh, career there, as it were, if I could use that expression, uh, as a shepherd. Um, but very quickly, um, uh, the, the, the authorities on the farm realized that he was prodigiously gifted. Uh, he was a fantastic horse rider. Uh, he learned um, various uh, 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 medical skills, just kind of herbal, herbal medicine. Uh, he, he, he knew how to kind of treat animals that were, that were suffering from various diseases. So very quickly, he rose within the ranks of the, of the slave farm and became basically the kind of assistant manager of, uh, of the plantation under uh, its, its leader, a man called Bayon de Libertat. And Bayon emancipates Toussaint. Uh, again, we don't have the exact date, but it's probably sometime around the 1770s. And so by the time we've got to the French Revolution and uh, the launching of the insurrection in 1791, Toussaint is already a 50-year-old uh, uh, man. And that, I think, is also something interesting. One often thinks of revolutionaries as young people. And revolutionaries are people who are often thought of as people who will be prepared to risk everything, are very romantic and idealistic. 
Well, Toussaint doesn't fit that uh, uh, profile at all. He's someone who, in fact, he doesn't know it yet, but he's, he's already lived most of his life, right, by 1791. Uh, uh, he's a mature, uh, 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 sober, um, responsible person, and he joins this revolution in 1791, and very quickly uh, he rises within the ranks of the revolution. He becomes a general in the French Republican Army. I want to go back to this uh, cover. This is the cover uh, of my book, and it's by uh, a, a Haitian artist called Francois Covin, who, uh, who painted this in 2009. Uh, I'm very keen not to use any of the images of Toussaint Louverture that date to the uh, 18th and 19th century because we don't really know what he looked like. Um, we know for sure that he sat for one painting, but that painting sadly has been destroyed or, or lost, so we don't have it anymore. So uh, I much prefer when, when I think about Toussaint, and of course when people drew black or, or painted black people in the 18th or 19th century. They often painted them in, in rather negative, stereotypical ways. So I much prefer this, this painting, which is a, a painting from a contemporary Haitian artist, and it shows Toussaint Louverture as a French general. You might notice that he has a, a guinea fowl on his head, which I think is, uh, you might think, curious. Why would you put a, basically a chicken on top of the head of a revolutionary leader? Um, this is interesting from the point of view of the traditions and the folklore of uh, Haiti and Saint-Domingue, because the guinea fowl was a, a, an animal, a bird, that was introduced in Saint-Domingue by um, colonizers in the uh, 17th century, I think. And one of, the, one of its characteristics almost immediately upon its being introduced in the island, was that it ran away, right? It refused to be kept captive. So for the enslaved uh, men and women of Saint-Domingue, the guinea fowl was always a symbol of freedom, a, a, a symbol of the refusal to be, uh, 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 to be cap to, to live a, a life of captivity. And up to this day, uh, the guinea fowl is a symbol of freedom, and, and that's why Francois uh, uh, has painted Toussaint in this way, and I think it's, it's just a lovely representation of his, uh, of his kind of revolutionary spirit. So who was Toussaint Louverture? I mean, I'll say a bit more about him in, in more detail in a moment, but just to give you a flavor of the kind of revolutionary leader that he becomes, he was flamboyant, he was charismatic, he had a prodigious memory. Um, he ate very little, slept very little, on average sort of three or four hours. Uh, he rarely slept in the same bed from one night to the other because he, he was always on the move. Um, he spent a lot of his time galloping on his white horse. Um, we know that he had several white horses. So that's, that's the kind of person that he was. He, um, he had... Uh, uh, massive support in the 1790s, and that was one of the most extraordinary things about him. Um, he was supported by, obviously, the, 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 the former slaves, the people that he had helped to emancipate, but also by the white settlers, um, because they regarded him as, uh, as their savior. They thought that he would help, help them uh, uh, keep at least some of their uh, interests and benefits in the island. And there was something almost magical about him. I mean, that's the only way I can kind of describe him. And, and the sense of magic, uh, 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 his own supporters believed that he, was, that he had kind of special magical powers. And even his opponents, even his adversaries, um, were mesmerized by him. They were bewildered by him. Uh, he was always uh, wrong-footing them. Uh, uh, and I have this quote from uh, uh, a French uh, uh, officer who arrives in the early 1800s to try and topple uh, Toussaint, and he describes him as follows. Louverture was a man who managed to make himself invisible where he was and visible where he was not. He seemed to have borrowed his spontaneity of movement from the tiger wonderful uh, 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 way of kind of characterizing him. Um, 
So what happens in the 1790s, I'll come back to this um, uh, in a little bit more detail uh, shortly, but just to give you the sort of one-minute summary, is that he gathers um, a group of supporters around him, um, rises to power, um, um, defeats all the uh, foreign uh, uh, forces um, that are trying to uh, uh, cling on to slavery on the island. These are mainly the Spaniards and the British. The British uh, are the baddies in this period, I'm afraid. They're there from 1793 up to 1798, and they're basically trying to maintain slavery on the island, right? So uh, not one of the kind of most glorious moments in British colonial history. Um, not sure there are many others, but anyway, that's, that's something else. But this is a kind of particularly uh, dark episode. Anyway, Toussaint defeats them and, and kicks them out, and he does the same thing to the, to the Spaniards. So he's a kind of great general. But he also, um, and this is uh, an interest, another interesting part of the story, he tactically out, outflanks the French administrators who are there and who are notionally administering the island in the name of France. And Louverture kind of befriends them, bullies them, you know, uses a kind of wide variety of tactics and basically um, packs them off one after the other. And the last French administrator who's there, who arrives in the late 1790s, Toussaint, I have to say, perhaps not very elegantly, um, basically um, arrests him and sends him into internal exile, um, where he's kept for two years before being sent back to France. So anyway, Toussaint establishes control over the island. And in 1801, he... Um, um, uh, promulgates a, a new constitution for the colony of Saint-Domingue. And this new constitution makes him governor for life, uh, abolishes slavery forever, and effectively makes Saint-Domingue um, an autonomous entity within the French colonial empire. So at this point, um, somebody else uh, enters the scene. I haven't mentioned him yet, but he plays a very major part in the story. This is Napoleon Bonaparte. Wendy mentioned uh, that I had written about him. Uh, he also plays uh, a very negative role, unfortunately, in this story, because Bonaparte has come to power in France in 1799, and as soon as he comes to power, he wants to restore order uh, in the colonies. And what that means for him is he needs to get rid of these black people who are running things. Uh, so he sends a military expedition to Saint-Domingue in late 1801, basically to kind of topple to saint Louverture, and, you know, not to put it, not to put it in any uh, 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 subtle way, because he says so explicitly, his aim in sending this military expedition to Saint-Domingue is to restore white rule, right? He wants to get rid of this new black leadership that has emerged on the island. Toussaint leads the resistance. Unfortunately, he's captured in 1802 and sent to a French fort where he dies in 1803. But the Haitian people, um, I mean, they're not yet Haitian, but about to become Haitian. Um, they uh, rise in a kind of final insurrection against the French invaders. They fight them off and defeat them at the Battle of Vertier in, 17, in November um, 1803. The French troops then leave Saint-Domingue. And as I said, Haiti uh, becomes an independent state in 1804. And so Toussaint Louverture didn't live to witness this moment. He had died uh, one year before. But I think we can, we can properly regard him as um, one of the founding fathers of modern Haitian independence. So before I talk a little, in a little bit more detail about this uh, revolution and the role that Toussaint Louverture played in it, there's one little question that I want to touch on, which is a comparative one, which is why, why did this revolution succeed? Um, uh, those of you who've done a little bit of reading about um, the history of slavery will know that um, slaves resisted in many places. In fact, we now know that in any place where there were a significant number of slaves, they didn't uh, uh, passively accept their condition, they fought. I mean, it was a very uneven fight, but, but they rebelled against their condition. 
And we know even in the 18th century that there were massive uprisings of, of, of enslaved people in Jamaica, um, in Dutch Guyana, um, in Venezuela, in Cuba, in the United States even, right? So in all of these places, slaves revolted. But they only succeeded in the way that the Haitians succeeded in one place, in, in Saint-Domingue. So why? why? Why did it succeed here and fail, at least fail in the kind of, to the extent that the objective is to overturn slavery, why did it fail in, in all these other places? Well, I think there's a number of reasons. And, and in spelling them out, I think I'm already starting to talk about the, the broader characteristics of the Haitian Revolution. The first reason is just numbers, right? I, 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 as I indicated to you earlier on, there's this huge disparity between the 30,000 white settlers and the 500,000 um, uh, uh, black slaves. So the army, uh, the slave army, um, was much bigger. Um, uh, uh, numbers is, aren't everything, but numbers uh, played a kind of significant role, at least, in allowing the slaves to fight back. The second reason, I think, is an interesting one because it's to do with their ideology. And the Haitian Revolution is really interesting because it, it, it's really a, a, a very original revolution in the sense that the ideas for transformation, the ideas for change, the ideas for um, uh, the better society that they're hoping to build come from a wide range of sources. They come from uh, the Enlightenment, they come from Europe, they come from revolutionary ideas of change that have gained currency there, but they also come from the Caribbean, and indeed Louverture himself is someone who um, has his own brand of Catholicism, he's someone who taps into the existing spiritual uh, 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 system of belief in Haiti, which is called Vodou and which plays an important role in the, uh, throughout these revolutionary periods. But there's also Africa. Um, these enslaved men and women come from Africa. As I mentioned to you at the beginning, uh, most of them were born in Africa. And many of them bring their, their, their beliefs, their values, uh, their practical skills. Many of them uh, uh, had been uh, combatants in, in various African armies. One of the things we know now, uh, those of us who've, uh, people, co colleagues who've studied the transatlantic slave trade, we know that probably a significant minority, if not a majority, of the slaves who were sent from Africa to uh, various parts of the Caribbean uh, and, uh, and the Americas were actually people who were captured during military conflicts, right? So these were people who already had some kind of, in, in, in some cases, quite advanced military training, military techniques. And they used these military techniques um, in their, um, in their uh, 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 war against the, the British, the Spaniards, and then finally the French. And there's also, I think, what is really interesting about the Haitian Revolution is that this is a revolution which brings together uh, many different kinds of political organization, right? Political organizations that are uh, uh, offshoots of the French Revolution, but also political organizations that are based locally um, and which derive from uh, the runaway slaves, which derive from local Catholic uh, organizations, which derive from the uh, uh, mobilizations of different groups. This is a revolution also uh, where women play uh, uh, an important role. Um, one of the striking characteristics, both of the early slave revolt after 1791 and what I think one could call the War of National Liberation, in uh, 1802, 1803, 1804, is that a lot of the combatants are women. Um, so this is a revolution in which women play um, a, a, a major role. And so in all of these respects, this is uh, a, a, an insurrection, a revolution which is distinct. And, and that, I think, is the reason why it succeeds. And last but not least, and of course I would say this, wouldn't I, having written a book about him, but I think leadership is also very important. 
you know, revolutions, and particularly slave revolutions, are more likely to succeed if they are effectively led. Uh, and very often when you look at slave revolts, particularly in the 18th century, often the one thing that they don't have is a clear, distinct, strong, uh, uh, charismatic leader. Uh, uh, so I think having, having that actually helped them enormously um, um, uh, in the late, late 17th and early 18th, uh, late 18th and early 19th century. Okay, so that, um, that's the kind of broad picture. Now, what I want to do is focus back um, onto uh, Louverture and the Haitian revolutions and just pick out some of the kind of big themes that I think come out of this revolution and um, really justify uh, us paying continuing attention to it in the 21st century. Because one of the things about this revolution is that although it was a uh, an enormously significant historical event, I think it also still speaks to us in, in the 21st century. And I'll try and say something about that very quickly um, at, the end, at the end of the talk. But um, I'm going to try and go uh, 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 a little bit more quickly now to make sure that we have a little bit of time for questions. Um, so what are the... the, the the main characteristics of this revolution. Um, the first thing, I think, is that this is a revolution which is about slavery, uh, fundamentally about slavery. Slavery is the unifying feature of the revolution. Um, uh, it is obviously the reason why uh, you have the revolution in the first place in 1791. Uh, the slaves are fighting to emancipate themselves. When you look at Toussaint Louverture's strategic objectives as a leader throughout the 1790s and all the way up to the early 1800s, you'll see that very firmly uh, uh, on his horizon is the goal of preserving uh, the abolition of slavery and protecting his people from re-enslavement. Because one of the things about Louverture is that he had you know, I, I talked about his magical powers. He had a kind of very uncanny sense of anticipating what might happen. And he knew that if the uh, uh, black people of Saint-Domingue abolished slavery, that, that, the, that the, uh, uh, the colonial powers in Europe wouldn't just say, wonderful, how fantastic, you know, uh, three cheers to you. They would try and find ways of restoring slavery. And that's eventually what Napoleon did in other parts of the Caribbean. He reimposed slavery, and, and France only finally abolished slavery in 1848. Um, but Louverture wanted to stop the French from re-enslaving the people of Saint-Domingue. So that's absolutely one of his um, cardinal objectives. So this is a revolution which I think fundamentally establishes uh, in the eyes of the world the legitimacy of um, the fight against slavery. It's a revolution. It's the first major revolution that brings this to everybody's attention. Secondly, it's a revolution about race. I mean, you can't talk about slavery without talking about race. And of course, slavery is based on a racial hierarchy um, in which black people are at the bottom and white people are, are on top. And this is where um, the originality of Toussaint Louverture and of the Haitian Revolution come, comes in. Toussaint imagined that a way of moving towards a, a new kind of society uh, after slavery, he, he, he imagines this through uh, a, a concept which I think is central to his political ideas, which is the concept of brotherhood or fraternity. Uh, when you read his speeches, and I spent a lot of time reading his, his letters. Um, this is his kind of squiggly handwriting. Um, I spent a lot of time in the archives trying to kind of decipher what he was saying. Uh, this is a, an especially nice letter because he wrote it, in, he wrote it himself. Um, he had five secretaries, so he spent all his time dictating to them. So most of the letters that we have are letters that have been written by his secretaries. I, I, I was very keen to show you this one because this one um, is, 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 a, is a letter that he addressed to one of the French colonial administrators. And he was so cross with him that he just wrote the letter himself. 
so uh, I wanted you to see his own handwriting. But basically what he, what he argues for is that after the end of slavery, um, the people of Saint-Domingue should be uh, united in brotherhood. And he, he, he talks about brotherhood in two ways, two related ways. One way is that he wants all the black people to forget about all the ethnic, religious, tribal differences uh, 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 that they were born with in Africa. Uh, he says, leave all of that behind. We are now a new people, and we need to work together and live together in harmony, us black people. And, and, and black unity is something that he talks about um, constantly throughout the 1790s. But brotherhood is also something that he intends to apply to all the people of Saint-Domingue. And what is extraordinary about his message is that he says to the white people, the mixed-race people, and the black people, everyone who's living in Saint-Domingue, he says, we are all one people, and we all uh, are going to build this new colony together. And he says to the white settlers, I know that you have been slave owners and that you have done terrible things to us, but we're prepared to forgive you if you are prepared to live with um, this new principle where all of us enjoy civil and political equality. Not economic e equality, right? Uh, that's something that I, if I have time, I'll come back to. Toussaint didn't want to dispossess the white settlers and take away their, 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 their properties. He said, you can enjoy your properties uh, uh, and you can have uh, wage laborers. Um, all we ask is that you pay them a decent wage, right? So that's the kind of new settlement that he proposes to them. So this idea of um, <clears throat> fraternity is something that uh, plays an absolutely central role in his, um, <clears throat> in his political philosophy. <clears throat> then um, there is his republicanism. Now, um, I want to say a word about this, too. Um, I've already sort of implied it in a way, but just to dwell on it a little bit. In, in the literature, um, a lot of people have written about Toussaint before me, and, um, and in fact, you know, I've, I've learned a, a great deal from their writings. Um, uh, <clears throat> but one of the things that I slightly disagree with um, actually most of the literature, is that people have tended to write about the Haitian Revolution as if it was just a sort of echo of the French Revolution. And um, the, the most famous book on the, French Revolu on the Haitian Revolution still to this day was written by a, a Caribbean historian called C.L.R. James. Uh, the book is called um, The Black Jacobins. And it's a, it's a biography of Toussaint Louverture, but Toussaint Louverture presented as a disciple of the French Revolution, basically. And I think that's fine. You know, Toussaint was someone who genuinely admired the French Revolution, but that wasn't everything for him. He was also someone who uh, drew upon the religious, scientific, and military traditions uh, of um, African people. He drew upon his own Catholicism. He drew upon even the spiritual ideas of the original inhabitants of the land of Haiti, who were the Native American Taino people. Haiti, by the way, is a word that means land of mountains, and uh, it was, that was the way that it was described, first described by the Native American uh, uh, populations of Haiti, who were wiped out by, by the settlers. By the time Toussaint Louverture has come in the uh, later 18th century, the Taino people have almost disappeared. And, and all we have left now of them is this, is this name, Haiti, which means uh, land of mountains. And Louverture is someone, therefore, who brings together, combines all these different motifs. And that's why I think this is such a spectacularly interesting revolution. Not only because it's successful, right? I mean... We study it for that reason, too, but because it's fantastically creative, it's fantastically original, and it speaks to different constituencies all at once. Uh, it speaks to the Europeans, it speaks to the people of the Caribbean, it speaks to the African uh, 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 traditions that these um, uh, formerly enslaved people were carrying with them. It's what you might call 
a, a, a kind of Creole republicanism. Creole in the sense that it's uh, taking different uh, elements and motifs and, and combining them together. And I have a really um, nice little example of this. I, I promised I would talk about Toussaint's name, L'Ouverture. Uh, it's a name that he adopts in 1793, uh, at the height of the uh, uh, early, early uh, insurrection of the slaves. And ouverture in French means opening. So the French thought, ah, fantastic. He's kind of taking a name, taking his name from us. So he's kind of recognizing that um, we are we are his uh, we are the people who inspire him. So in in the in the French literature in particular on, on Toussaint Louverture, the choice of this name Louverture is is typically seen as Toussaint recognizing the kind of superiority of the French and. To some extent, that's what Toussaint wanted the French to believe. However, when you uh, look, take a closer look at Vodou uh, spirituality, Vodou religion, uh, Vodou has a lot of different uh, gods, deities. And one of them is a deity called Legba, Papa Legba. And Legba is the uh, guardian of the gates. Basically, he's the deity that you uh, uh, appeal to when you're trying to... Um, take a new turn in your life, when you're trying to move out of uh, a situation where you think things are not going terribly well, and you need help to be able to move into the next phase, the next or better phase of your life. And, and, and Legba is the guardian of the gate, the gateway to this better life. So um, he's the guy who gives you the opening to the new life. So when Toussaint chooses the word l'ouverture, he's speaking to the French and telling them, um, you know, don't worry, I'm one of yours. I believe in the Enlightenment and, and in all the principles that you, you claim to, to uphold. But he's also speaking to the, his own people, the, the vast majority of whom were born in Africa and who celebrate the Vodou religion. And he's saying, I'm a man who's going to be opening the, the gates for you too. And that's a really good example of how skillful he was as, um, as a political uh, leader. Um, this is uh, another one of the rather more recent representations of Toussaint. Um, uh, I like it because it, 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 it has this kind of um, mystical aura. Um, time is <coughs> running out, and I wanted to spend at least uh, three, four minutes before closing, as I promised, talking about the legacy, because this is a fantastic story, and I could go on and on talking about it, but let's leave some time for what happens afterwards. So Haiti becomes um, the first uh, independent post-colonial uh, black state, and the story of the Haitian Revolution after uh, 1804 is a very interesting one, and it's a story which is, in which in many senses the success continues, because the Haitian Revolution continues to inspire um, anti-slavery and anti-colonial movements across the Atlantic, and it inspires, obviously, the, the, the ongoing fight against slavery. And, and you know, you must know that one has to realize slavery isn't fully abolished in all parts of the Atlantic world until the late 19th century, right? So this is a battle that continues in, in, in many parts of, of the Atlantic world. And, and Louverture is celebrated as a hero by <coughs> very many people who um, are, are continuing this struggle. It's a fight for uh, racial justice, for self-determination, for popular sovereignty. And just to give you some specific examples, there's this great Latin American revolutionary hero called Simon Bolivar, who goes on to liberate um, uh, uh, Latin America from Spanish rule. The Haitians help him um, uh, at a crucial moment in his struggle against the Latin Americans. When you look at the United States, perhaps the greatest um, uh, figure to emerge uh, in the fight against slavery is a man called Frederick Douglass. You may have heard of him. And Frederick Douglass was someone who just went around 
um, talking, uh, campaigning against slavery. And in every lecture that he gave, whether it was in America or in Britain, um, he talked about Toussaint Louverture. He was absolutely uh, obsessed with him and regarded him as a kind of great example of emancipation. And these appeals to uh, uh, the ideas of black dignity and black equality continued in the 20th century in uh, the various anti-colonial struggles uh, of the 20th century. You see it both in um, uh, the, the formation of uh, uh, intellectual movements, such as the negritude movement, or in movements that were fighting uh, to, to, free, uh, to free themselves from imperialism and colonialism. For example, Fidel Castro, uh, before he comes to power in, in, in the late 1950s, He's someone who's a great admirer of Toussaint Louverture and of the Haitian revolutionaries. Ho Chi Minh in Vietnam talks about uh, the Haitian revolution. So this is a revolution that becomes um, um, emblematic, if you like, across the 19th and across the 20th century. And when we look at Toussaint today, we see that he's celebrated, of course, by the Haitians. This is a coin uh, in his honor. There's a statue of Toussaint in, uh, in, uh, in the province of Alada in Benin, which is where his, his ancestors came from. Uh, there's a, a bust of him in Montréal. Uh, in La Rochelle in France, there's a very striking um, uh, 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 statue of him. Uh, and, and this perhaps is the most fitting. Uh, in the Panthéon in, Fra in, in, in Paris, the Panthéon is the place where the French bury their national heroes. They bury and celebrate their national heroes. L'Ouverture, you will remember, was uh, uh, captured, uh, uh, imprisoned, and died uh, uh, in France in 1803. Now, since the late 20th century, the French uh, uh, have put up this plaque. Um, they don't have his body anymore, so they can't bury him there, uh, rebury him there but at least they've put up this plaque saying, to the memory of Toussaint Louverture, fighter for freedom, artisan uh, uh, of the abolition of slavery, uh, Haitian hero, died at the Fort de Joux um, in 1803. So Toussaint Louverture's spirit uh, lives on, and it lives on uh, uh, also in social movements. Um, uh, we noticed that, for example, uh, in the most recent Black Lives Matter mobilization. People were uh, mentioning Toussaint Louverture. Uh, uh, colleagues of mine told me, particularly in America, uh, Louverture or Haitian flags appeared. And uh, I'll end with a quote um, from Louverture, uh, which I think is, is a quote that um, both captures uh, his own philosophy and also the reason why um, uh, uh, he continues to matter. And this was uh, something that he said when he was captured uh, in 1802, um, and he's about to be taken away. He tells his, uh, uh, cap uh, the people who've captured him, by striking me, you have cut the tree of black liberty, but it will str spring back from its roots, for they are many and deep. Thank you very much. start with the villain, villain of the piece um, and the question is there are various stories about his capture by Bonaparte. Some say he was duped into going to France and was captured there. Is this correct? Yes. Um, basically what happens is that <clears throat> there's a there's a kind of military stalemate um, after a few months after the French land, and Toussaint negotiates a ceasefire. And basically, he, he had realized that the best way of getting rid of the French would just be to let um, local conditions take care of them, and, 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 uh, 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 and they, they would probably be defeated uh, over time by you know, disease and uh, uh, just the kind of attrition uh, of that kind. However, Bonaparte had given express orders that he, Napole that uh, Toussaint should be captured uh, and, and brought back to France. And so they set a trap for him. And he, 
uh, perhaps the only time in his life, because he was normally very careful, and, uh, uh, but he went to this meeting with just uh, one or two uh, people uh, with him instead of taking a kind of military detachment. And so the French captured him and immediately um, put him on a boat with his family and took him to France. Yes, it's slightly surprising that lapse in his judgment when he's been so assiduous all those years in being strategic and one step ahead of the enemy. Yes, yes. Um, it was the... Again, there's various, there's various thoughts there. One was that he had perhaps become a little overconfident and, and thought that the French were on the back foot. Um, more, even more far-fetched, I mean, I don't buy this, but, but there are people who think this. Some people thought he, he almost sacrificed himself, that, that, he, that he felt that he had done everything that he could and that uh, his, his lieutenants would pick up the fight and, uh, and carry it to its conclusion. I, I don't think... I, he wasn't that sort. You know. He was someone who basically thought he was the best person to, to, do, uh, to do the job. So, I mean, even very clever people make mistakes sometimes. Alas. Yeah. One from Elizabeth. Um, she says, Louverture seems to show a very well-educated That's a very interesting question. We don't, we don't absolutely know for sure. Because to give you a sense of the, the kind of disparity in the, in the documentation, we have hundreds, thousands of documents about Toussaint after 1791. But for the whole 50-year period before 1791, we have, I think, a total of three documents. Right? So we don't know. Um, but we think that he was educated partly by the Jesuits. The Jesuits were there around the north of the colony. Um, and and they, they probably taught him the rudiments of um, uh, uh, reading and writing. Uh, he had a stepfather uh, who we know taught him some mathematics. Um, but I think most of his, most of his uh, uh, education, I mean, he, he, not, not uncharacteristically for the period, um, he... He educated himself, um, and so in, and, 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 and a lot of that happened in the early 1790s. Um, the, the other interesting thing, just to throw in here, is that you, live, you, you may have noticed that for the first 50 years of his life, I didn't say anything about his military training. He didn't have any, right? And 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 he, he probably and and slaves weren't allowed to own weapons. Right? I mean, it was a very dangerous thing if they did. So before 1791, he had zero military training, yet he rose to become a, a general in the French Republican Army, and he beat the British, the French, the, the British, the Spaniards, and, and laid the grounds for the defeat of the French, someone with zero training. All of that self-learning. Self uh, I was interested in why this revolution, why the revolutions in, in slave territories were so rare. And you spoke to that about how um, the numbers were on your side. But that must have surely been common that in most slave territories there are far more slaves than there were settlers. So maybe you can say a little bit more about why slave revolutions didn't tend to be successful. Thank you. Yes, well, I went, I went fairly quickly. I mean, numbers, I think, is one of the factors. I mean, in Saint-Domingue, the disparity was perhaps greatest than anywhere else, right? There were very few places. It's just that Saint-Domingue had become so profitable by the late 18th century that the French just brought in masses of slaves, right? So, so they basically prepared the ground for the revolution in no other... Uh, uh, slave society was there such a big disparity between the um, <coughs> the uh, 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 the settlers and the slaves, but I think it's also to do with those other factors that I talked about: leadership, um, military training, um, and also the one other factor that I didn't mention is that the Haitian Revolution is not the kind of starting point of the resistance by the the slaves of Saint Domingue. 
from the mid-1740s, you have several instances of them um, revolting. And so um, this is, in a sense, the culmination of four or five decades of resistance by the slaves in Saint-Domingue. And, and that, I think, is also very relevant, right? They, they tried out various uh, other forms of insurrection, and 1791 is the, is the sort of culmination of it. I wanted to know what you felt about Toussaint from a personal aspect, because you talk quite passionately about him, his lifestyle, but on a personal level, how do you feel about, you know, about him as a person, if that makes sense? What do I feel personally about him? I mean... Having spent uh, basically three years researching him and uh, trying to get to know him uh, uh, as, as closely as I could, uh, I feel, firstly, I suppose, admiration for all the things that he achieved. And, and, and if you compare him to all the... There are many big revolutionary leaders who are emerging at this time, right? This is, the, it's, this is a period that is sometimes called the age of revolutions, right? You have revolutions in France, in America, in, in, uh, in Latin America. Um, Toussaint didn't have any of the advantages that even these great revolutionary leaders in other places had. That's why I think he, is, he and the Haitian people are so special, right? This is someone who isn't born uh, 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 with any of these uh, 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 either material or educational advantages. So um, I think that makes him somebody quite remarkable. And, and, and that's the main feeling I have about him. Uh, I do sometimes find him frustrating because one of the things that he does try and do systematically is to be um, obscure. Right? He, he tries to stop you from actually... Uh, finding out exactly what he's thinking. Uh, and he's very good at that. So uh, sometimes I feel uh, I don't know for sure. Um, did he want Saint-Domingue to be independent, for example? That's a question that uh, uh, historians, and, and indeed the people in Haiti, are still uh, arguing passionately about to this day. We don't really know, because he never wrote down what he really thought about that. He always, his, his basic line was, no, 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 I don't want independence. I just want us to remain French and, and, and continue to, to benefit from this association with France. But, you know, um, maybe he did think in the long run uh, Saint-Domingue would become independent, but he never actually said it, so. Thank you. Um, I'm going to jump in with a teacher question from uh, where Marbury School just down the road. Thank you very much for having us. Um, I'm interested in why... There's been an upsurge in interest in uh, Toussaint over to over the last few years, and also how he sort of constructed in Western historiography in particular. So, is he a sort of comfortable leader, i.e., the, the Martin Luther King of the story? And are there are there other stories that we're not so familiar with because they're perhaps not as comfortable? Thank you. Yeah, I know that's a great question, and. Well, for a, long time, for a long time, people just didn't talk about the Haitian Revolution that much. It was just regarded as um, this kind of minor tremor. And then the big earthquakes were the French and the American revolutions. I mean, now we see that actually the Haitian Revolution was much more radical than both the French and the American revolutions. So I'd say over the last 15 to 20 years, hate, the Haitian Revolution is now taken seriously. And of course, the main reason it's taken seriously is that it, it was about slavery. And, and, and we're now, through our re-examination of uh, our own colonial past in, in countries like Britain and France, or in the case of America, the history of its own very problematic relationship with slavery, we're now regarding, looking at um, these revolutions much more closely. And one of the things that we're also finding is that the Haitian Revolution had a major impact on, um, on American politics too, right? So um, <clears throat> he's someone, he, uh, the, the revolution in general, and Toussaint Louverture in particular, have benefited, I suppose, from this um, re reconnection that, that we've now made. And I think it's a good thing. 
with uh, uh, our, our own colonial and, and, and slave histories. And there's another reason why I think uh, L'Ouverture and the Haitian Revolution are back in our, in our horizon, and that's the issue of reparations. Um, one of the very big questions that we are now talking about is do we owe reparations to the people who were enslaved, um, to the countries that were enslaved? And this is a particularly acute question in Haiti because when the French left Haiti, they left physically, but 15, 20 years later, they basically blockaded the, the island and forced the independent Haitian government to basically pay the, the French settlers who had left the colony by then um, for, to compensate them for their, the loss of their slaves. And that debt um, has been estimated by um, leading French economists to amount to uh, 30 billion euros in today's money. It took the Haitians um, 150 years, basically, to, 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 pay, uh, to pay, pay this debt. If you, if you calculate the interest, it's even more. So, um, so this is, I mean, I don't, I don't have any problem calling this a crime. Right. This was a crime against the Haitian people. And um, the French should pay. Um, they don't want to. They don't even want to acknowledge that this is a debt that they should honor. So these are the kind of conversations that we're, that we're now having. And Haiti and, and Louverture are, are, are very important, not just for historical reasons, but because the impact of the things that were done in the uh, 18th and 19th century are still continuing to be felt by peoples um, all over these formerly enslaved societies today. Thank you so much, Sadir. I'm afraid we are going to have to stop there. That was absolutely fascinating. Thank you. Thank you for your